Hey, good day, fellow deal makers. Welcome to the Deal Scout. On today's show, we're going to have a conversation about deal gen. Joe, welcome to the show. What's going on, Josh? Good yeah. to be here. Great. This is awesome, man. So, deal gen is that kind of like you know lead gen, but for deals, you know, kind of explain what that is. Yeah, that's basically you know what it is in a nutshell. Um, you know, our company specializes in, in going out and finding deal opportunities for investors, private equity companies, you know, helping mergers and acquisitions uh, companies get deals across the finish line. So we took the word, you know, lead gen is is going out and finding leads for a prospect, you know, prospects for your clients, maybe in some other fields. But when it comes to the businesses that we operate, you know, they're looking for deals. And so that's why we, we decided to go with deal gen instead of, you know, traditional lead gen. Oh, I like it. I like it because in I've been in marketing, you know, a long time, you know, lead gen is just like, here you go, fellas, you know, like what, how do you, how do you see lead gen being, you know, different than just, you know, tossing over a lead, like, Hey, Josh, here's his phone number. What, what do you guys do different? And then I would love to hear your story, man, on, on how you got to this place. This is super fascinating. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think what we do different, you know, it's lead generation is you know can come from all different places right like you can you know run traditional digital marketing where you might get a lead through running seo campaigns or you might you know run some facebook ads um around what you do and and you know leads might come through your website or um you know they might come through you know referrals who you know have like if you for example my background i i used to operate you know a moving and storage company and so we actually had some specific clients that we would want to work with, but, you know, friends and family would just think moving in storage and anytime they knew anybody that was even remotely doing something related to a truck and moving something from one place to another, you know, they would think they had a lead for us. And so, you know, while we completely, you know, were, were thankful for every opportunity that they thought of us, um, at the end of the day, you know, leads can be kind of misleading. And, and that's a, that's a interesting thing that I've kind of learned. So when it comes to deal gen, you know, we're trying to, there's, there's this kind of an art of making a deal. A deal has to be, you know, something that's good for both parties, you know, one party in our, in our world, you know, one party has to want to either make an investment or, or buy um, an existing asset and another party has to want to receive that uh, investment or, sell what they have. And so you have to, you know, understand what the value is for both sides. You know, there's, and there's different values on each plate and then create a deal, you know, where there's, there's, a, uh, there's no winner and loser, right? There's, there's more of like a, one side got a piece of the value that they were looking for. The other side got a piece of the value they were looking for. Everybody hopefully, you know, is mutually uh, beneficial. And, and, and so we go out and try to find deals where we can, you know, understand what our client who is typically one part of that uh, equation wants and what they are looking for, you know, in a deal and then go help them find, you know, the other end of it where it's someone who's looking to let go of what our client wants, you know, and, and, and that's, that's where we kind of take it a step further. Yeah, there's almost like a tug of war, and I've worked in, in corporations and PE groups and, and such. There's almost like a tug of war between sales and marketing. Marketing will toss up a lead, right? Like I could equate it back in the day when I was doing real estate. Um, you know, I got a lead from working the floor, and it was to sell a you know a, a little grandmother's mobile home park in, or mobile home, not even a park, a single mobile home in the national forest, which was like a thirty mile drive from me. Yeah. Um, so that was a lead where my true desire was to work with investors buying and, you know, doing spec houses, right? So they were in, you know, fix and flips as well. So that was a big difference between the lead of the you know, mobile home versus what I truly desired. So there was always this tug of, and I like how you said it, a misleading lead. It wasn't a good deal for me. Right. She wants to sell that mobile home, but you don't necessarily want to represent her, you know, like, but there's probably someone else that does. Yeah. But if we're, we're if you were our client, you know, and, and, and we don't operate in real estate, but let's just say you were our client. Um, part of finding you a deal would be understanding that and the understanding that you're not looking for um, the woman with the mobile home 
30 miles from your house. You know, you're looking to work, work with investors. So yeah. we would, you know, craft our offerings and craft our messaging and, and build our campaigns around the idea that you're looking to target investors and not, you know, the other types of leads that might come through that other people, you know, from the outside looking in who don't understand your world and what you do might say, this is a lead. But in reality, it's, it's not what you want. So it's not a lead. <laughs> yeah. A lead is not a deal, right? That is no, a lead is not a deal. A deal is, is definitely a few steps past the lead where a deal is now forming. You know what I mean? Uh, something like you've, you've taken the lead to a qualified prospect and then you've taken that qualified prospect and found out what they want. And then you've combined the two parties to form the beginning of a potential deal. And, yeah. and we're looking to do the deal. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I like deals too. I'm a, I'm a deal guy. Um, Joe, let, let's go backwards. Let, let's kind of, how did you get your start in this? You know, kind of give us your, your entrepreneurial journey as a deal maker. Like what did that look like for you? Yeah, no, of course. Um, so I went to um, Babson College where my current business partner, Brian, also went. And um, while I was there, you know, Babson's a very entrepreneurial school. So I didn't know what I wanted to be when I got there. Um, but, you know, I took a bunch of classes about entrepreneurship. I learned a lot from, you know, just actually creating a, our own business while we were in college. And it just seemed, you know, it, it seemed like the only path for me. And so, um, you know, I was never a good employee. Uh, I never, you know, I just... I, I needed to work for myself. And so a year after college, I graduated, I started a company with two classmates of mine um, and it was called on-demand storage. And basically we operated, you know, in the, uh, in the moving and storage world, particularly focused on storage of physical goods um, for, you know, B2B and a lot of, you know, B2C clients who were looking to, you know, declutter their garage or something like that. And so, um, it was great. You know, I, it was great in the sense that we built it from literally nothing um, to, you know, a, a seven figure business. Um, and we, we learned so much in doing so, you know, not only about, um, it, we learned a lot about what not to do by, you know, falling on our face and, and losing money. And, and I've kind of learned myself that oftentimes the only way to learn to truly learn um, is by doing something and failing or, by losing money, you know what I mean? Cause then you, you realize, Hey, I don't want to do that again. So let's avoid, you know, that trap and, and let's rethink how to do that. And so we had many of those instances where we learned those things, but in growing that company, you know, I learned a lot and I tested a lot and worked with a lot of marketing agencies and, and learned a lot of my own about how to generate, um, generate prospects and get in front of clients and market, you know, and position what we had to offer to who we wanted to do business with. And so in doing that, you know, I, I kind of learned a lot of, about the tools that, you know, we can use to not only get in front of those prospects, but then make it more of like an automated process where now this is happening every single day, you know, without someone actively having to do it, or it's coinciding with all the active work that we're doing. So if I'm a salesman and I'm, or a CEO or president of a company, I'm picking up the phone, and sending emails and doing all this stuff. Now I'm using some tools to double down, you know, on my efforts where I'm going to still do that every day. But at the same time, in the background, you know, we're going to have all these different engines running to um, bring more prospects and more potential deals to the table. And so I learned all about that running my own company. And then, you know, in last year, um, in 2021, I sold that business. And so when I did that, you know, I, I took a step back and I thought long and hard about what I wanted to do next. And, um, you know, a lot of what I wanted to do next was doing that, you know, continuing to um, build out those, those sales engines and build out those, you know, platforms and use the tools, you know, that I had really learned to, you know, kind of master and, um, and get good at and use them for myself, continue to use them for myself, but also, you know, introduce um, clients and other businesses to it. And so when we, you know, I joined forces with Brian, Brian Scanlon, who, you know, uh, is a good friend of ours. And, and he, he was running his own um, digital marketing agency called Posted Social. And a lot of what Brian focused on was traditional digital marketing, you know, SEO and Facebook ads, stuff like that for clients. But he had this whole other piece of his business where 
he was running a lot of the same engines that I'm talking about, you know, using LinkedIn as a prospecting tool, using email to not just mass spam people, but to actually really get, you know, in depth and build out the right lists and send personalized, personalized emails to the right list of people, you know, it's so powerful. And so he was doing that already. And when, when we came together, you know, we kind of looked at each other and said, Hey, what are we best at? And what, where can we add the most value? You know, um, at the time, Facebook was, you know, a lot of people are, are struggling with Facebook right now because it's just gotten so much more expensive than it was four or five years ago. And so we, we basically niched down our, our offering to be pretty much all what we like to call deal gen, um, which is a combination of, you know, direct marketing. We like to call it direct marketing. So it's, it's using LinkedIn, using email, you know, using these different tools and combining them into a sequence that just makes sense. And, and then we actually took a step further, you know, after testing it, you know, with our own businesses and, you know, using it for a, a lot of different clients. Um, we figured out, you know, not, not only what position, what industry we think it works best in, but what industry we wanted to focus on too. And so it was a good, you know, I think both are very really important. And so, um, that's what led us to, you know, this kind of private equity and mergers and acquisition space, um, along with the fact that Brian had a background in that space for years, you know, so he understood the pain points and, you know, what these people, you know, what these individuals who are in that space truly need. And we just took a long, hard look at it, combined everything together. And, you know, here we are today with, um, you know, dozens of clients and, um, and it's, it's just been a, it's just been fun to see it all come together. Awesome, man. I appreciate you sh you sharing the story, man. Uh, it seems like every single college, you know, person somehow ends up in the moving industry, right? <laughs> or, or moving right. stuff around, right? Because we're, we're young, we're strong. Uh, I've worked at a few. Um, you created an on demand storage. Now, how did you think of that niche rather than just a moving company? What differentiated you between a traditional moving company, two guys in a truck and on demand storage? Good question. Um, we wanted the, the, the cool thing about storage is that it's recurring. So there's a recurring, um, revenue aspect to it yeah. where, you know, you get a client and basically the model is simple. You know, you either rent or buy a large space and then you divide it up into a, a, you know, a bunch of smaller spaces and you rent those smaller spaces, you know, similar to an apartment building. Um, you just, it's the same exact model. You know, it's a big building with a bunch of apartments. There's a big warehouse with a bunch of, you know, storage units. And so if you get a client, you know, what we realized before we even dove into that world is that the average storage client actually stays in storage for over you know, two and a half years. And so we kind of just had to go out and find, you know, as many people who were looking to um, store, you know, excess stuff and fill up space. And so that's what we wanted to focus on because, you know, moving is, there's a lot of people who have you know, kind of mastered that business and, and made a living out of it, but you're, you're kind of only as good as your next client, you know, and, and it's a really, really uh, intense business to be in um, when it comes from like all the different moving parts, you know, uh, the amount of employees you need, the amount of trucks you need, the amount of insurance you need you know, the amount um, of new leads and new opportunities you need every single day, you know, versus um, the storage end of the, of the business is more, hey, we can get this one lead and have them pay us over and over and over and over again. And so that's why we branded ourselves as on-demand storage. Now we, we would do, um, and the company still to this day, you know, does do some traditional transportation and logistics, but it, it's it's very storage focused for that recurring aspect and the the fact that we need less people and less trucks to do it yeah well it's super smart because uh you you mentioned you know i worked in the moving industry and you're constantly fighting to get that next deal but it's how often do people move their house or their office not very often so it's like you spend all this money to acquire a customer you do the job and then it's on to the next whereas you guys would spend all this money to get the customer and then they, the average customer would stay two and a half years on a, on an average storage. So it's, it's really brilliant how you guys did that. That seems like a, a really smart business model. You mentioned 
that one of the ways that you guys had to learn and grow is by failing, falling on your face and losing money. What are some uh-huh. lessons that you've learned that you could share with us and, and other fellow deal makers? Um, well, there's a few, you know, um, I think being really mindful of your overhead when you're starting a company is something that we learned the hard way. You know, we, um, I mean, in our, in our business, we had to rent space, right. In order to do what we want to do, we needed space to do it. And so we would take out, you know, we, we actually rented the first few warehouses we had and, and we would rent, you know, and sign these three or five year leases and then have to fill the, you know, backfill, um, the space with customers. And, and it was really kind of like, it wasn't the only way to do that. You know, it really wasn't, but, um, to us at the time, you know, it seemed like the only way to do it. And so you end up sacrificing, you know, a lot of, um, your own personal pay and your own personal, you know, uh, well-being, uh, for the, for the sake of filling that space. And so that was one thing that, you know, taking out loans, um, racking up debt and get, you know, signing, signing documents to get overhead, you know, when you're, when you're just getting started is, um, something that puts a lot of pressure on you personally and the business. And so what I kind of took away from that is like, you really got to think long and hard before you, before you leap, you know, and I always encourage people to leap because that's the only way you're actually going to get anything done, but think long and hard about like, am I doing this? the most effective way before you do like with our, with our new business, you know, posted social, we've kind of been very mindful of like, yeah, it would be easy to go, you know, downtown. And especially now with COVID, like there's probably so much like office space available, but you know, at the end of the day, is like that a necessary thing for us to get clients and do good work? Probably not. You know what I mean? So yeah, we could go do it. And traditionally businesses do have, you know, this fancy downtown office space with windows overlooking the city, but why would we do that? You know what I mean? Like we don't, we're not, we're not there yet, nor do we ever really even have to get there after really thinking about it that long and hard. So that, that's something that like kind of really stuck with me is that like, be really mindful of your expenses at the beginning and be really mindful of what you want out of the company too. Like, you know, a lot of the time, the reason to start a company is because you see more opportunity to, you know, for self benefit than you would at a traditional job. And so people forget that, you know what I mean? Like they, they start a company and they think, you know, at the beginning, like before they even leave their other business, like, Hey, this is going to be so much better for my life. And then they just create this job for themselves that and this stress for themselves that like, isn't that at all. And so you really got to like, remember, Hey, I'm doing this because it's a better alternative than what I left or what I could be doing for somebody else. And so your actions have to like follow that methodology. You know, you, you should pay yourself from the beginning. If you can, you know, you should be mindful of your own personal expenses um, and not sacrifice that. And you should be mindful if you know, your family and stuff is important to you. Obviously it is to a lot of people. You should be mindful of the sacrifices that they have to make, you know, now that you're doing this. And so, you know, I could go on and on. We could do a whole podcast about that stuff. (laughs) Totally. Totally. Well, I, it's so true, but, you know, I see a lot of entrepreneurs, right. That are running from something, right. Like the job they got laid off or they hated their boss or they want freedom, but then they, they tie themselves to a, another job, right. It's the whole business quadrants, the Kiyosaki's four quadrants where they just created a self-employment for them, not necessarily a business. Yeah. How did you learn that the hard way? (laughs) Well, I left the job that was in real estate, which is the field that I, you know, love the most coming out of college and, and still have a passion for, but I got a job in real estate that I thought, you know, I really would love. And then I didn't end up liking it. And so when we had this opportunity to start our own business, you know, just like I had just described, you know, to me, it was like, oh, there is going to be this sense of freedom. You know, I'm going to own my own company. It's going to be, it's going to be, um, you know, I'm going to do things on my terms, And then you end up signing, you know, leases and taking on overhead and taking out loans that now you're, you know, personally guaranteeing. So that freedom goes away really fast when you have to now work, you know, tirelessly and endlessly to fulfill and be able to pay those things back and not only be able to pay those things back, but be able to make enough money to pay your own bills and and yourself. And so that's what we did when we were you know, 
young and dumb and 24 is we, we, we learn those things the hard way and really sacrifice for like a year or two, you know, like sacrifice hard for a year or two, uh, personally, just to make the business, you know, get to a point where it could exceed just its own expenses. And so that's a hard lesson to learn. You know what I mean? It's something that like, anytime I have the opportunity to speak to someone who's trying to start a business, you know, a couple of times this year alone, I've had kids, you know, from Babson, my alma mater call me and um, just to pick my brain and, and talk about their own businesses. And, you know, I really stress to them, like we had a, I had a student call me about, you know, a logistics company he wanted to start and how he wanted to rent warehouse space and stuff like that. And I buy a truck and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like think about how you can do this differently. You know what I mean? And, and maybe one day you'll get there, but maybe there's a whole nother path that you can take without needing to put yourself through that, you know, and, and you should be working long, hard hours at the beginning of your business, but not because you're in like some super stressful place and you signed away your life, you know, it should be because you wanted to succeed. And so we kind of did the, like, we, we forced ourselves into making it like stressful. And I, I just wouldn't take that path again. So you and I, let's just say you and I are starting up another on-demand, you know, storage place here in Florida, and we could do it differently from what you've done in the past, right? What are some key components that you think you would do differently with same business model, maybe here in Florida that you wish you would have done then? Well, I do want to point out too, before we, I answer that question, that the, the business does still exist, you know, and, and, um, oh, cool. and so it, it's still actively going and, and they are pursuing, you know, kind of more of this less overhead path um, and doing a really good job of, of that. And so I do want to give credit um, to, to the company for, we overcame those things, you know what I mean? And we did, but it, it took us, a couple of years to do it and, and really learning the hard way to get there, you know, and eventually we, we were persistent enough to, to overcome it. Um, and they're still going in the right direction, but you know, if I were, if we were to do that and you had this idea, you know, of, Hey, let's, let's do this again and let's, um, rent a bunch of space and, you know, get the trucks and, and we'll get the guys to, to do the work and stuff. My first question would be, how can we do it? How can we, what's the purpose of doing it? Right. Like what is the, it, is it because there's a huge opportunity, you know, in storage and there's massive demand. And the reason why I'd ask that is because if there's massive demand, you know, not only on a, on a national level, but maybe a regional level or a regional level, national level, you know, we want to be able to scale. Right. So we don't want to limit ourselves to one building. We like, because one building runs out of space pretty soon. So we want to be able to, scale and take advantage of that demand, not only within like one town, but regionally and nationally, if we can. And so if the purpose of starting the business is to take advantage of that national demand, then we shouldn't go sign a warehouse. We should think about how we can take advantage of that demand, but use someone else's assets to do it. You know, and so there's a lot of people out there, there's a lot of companies out there that inherently have warehouse space, whether they're the moving companies, logistics companies, manufacturing companies, um, you know, some of our competitors were, were using, um, we're using even like sh shopping malls and, and, um, big box stores, you know, and, and there's so many of these existing buildings that people already rent, you know, and people already need to make, they need to cover that expense on their own. And so we could take advantage of that demand, you know, but store it at a climate controlled facility that someone else is already renting that they want to make more money off of. Right. So yeah. if we, you know, had a hundred dollars, if every client paid us $200 a month, you know, but we could incentivize someone, Hey, you have 30% of your space that you currently rent is dead space. You know, can we come rent that for you? And we'll give you, I don't know. I, I we haven't done the margin, but we'll give you 30% of the client, you know, every client that we bring in, you know, would that be meaningful? Cause you're not using that space and making money off of it now. Totally. And so, in that business model, you could do that locally where you are. You could do that regionally and you could do that nationally if there's demand for it. And then the next piece of it would be, okay, how are we going to get the stuff to the facility? And you could think about it the same way. You know, should we go rent and buy our own trucks or should we take advantage of someone that already has trucks that, you know, their business model is to keep them on the road as long as possible. And 
you, so you start to think about it just differently and in doing so, you know, then instead of taking out debt to get buildings and, and get trucks and all these things, maybe you're raising money because you want to blow up the business model. You know I mean? You want to, you want to make it bigger, but the money that you're raising isn't going towards, you know, kind of dead assets. It's going towards marketing and creating a brand, you know what I mean? And so that's how I would do, that's how I would go about it differently than we did at the very beginning of doing what we did. Yeah. Super cool. So you have a, it looks like you, you have some experience with podcasting. Uh, I'm looking through your LinkedIn now. Uh, do you still do podcasting? I, I haven't done it in probably four or five months. Um, okay. This year, you know, I kind of took a break from it, um, but I do have experience doing it. I, I did my own podcast for two years. Um, I did 200 episodes, which nice. is a lot to cram into two years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was called the Get It Done Podcast. Um, it's something that I would love to fire up again. You know, I just, um, I want to, I want it to have more of a, a purpose than it, than it did for just everything. You know what I mean? Like it, it was a lot of it. I learned so much doing it and I learned how much I loved doing it. Like it's a great exercise, a great way to meet people. It's a great way to express yourself. It's a great way to create content, you know? So I loved it for all those things. Um, but you know, you can, you can use it for, you know, even more, you know, and, and that's what I haven't really found what I want that more to be, um, to put the time into it because it is a time, it is a time, um, you know, you have to, you have to dedicate a lot of time to doing it the right way. And so if I'm going to do it the right way, you're going to take the time to get guests, going to take their time from them to come on the show. You know, I want there to be like a real reason to do so, um, which you have, you know, and, and it, I think it's great. And I love what you do on your show, but I, I, at the end of the day, I think podcasting is amazing and I listen to them, you know, I watch them. I'll even like, instead of watching TV, I'll throw YouTube on and watch podcasts like it. So I, uh, I, I look forward to the day I can, I jump back in. Oh, cool. Well, maybe, maybe we'll do something together in the future on that. Um, so, at, as you have you gone through your career and what you guys are doing now, now you're focusing on putting deals together for deal makers. Who are ideal clients that you guys work with to help them find deals, not just leads where it's like, Hey, you know, here's a lead, but you know, the beginning steps of a relationship, the beginning steps of a deal, what kind of groups do you work with? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, we work with, you know, a, a, a fair amount of our clients are companies with like buy side mandates. Um, so I think that's like the first people that we, we, you know, that would be like our ideal client, you know, someone who has a fund raised, um, and they are, they know exactly what they want. You know, they've already built out their business model and their thesis around the fund, obviously, in order, they, I mean, they needed to, to, in order to get the money. And, um, and so they have the money ready to go. And now they need to look at as many potential deals as they possibly can. And so we work with a couple of people in that space who are looking to buy software companies. Um, but the, the kind of the main thing is just like, you know, that that's a perfect client and it doesn't necessarily matter what type of company they want to, to buy or acquire, you know, it just matters that we know their strategy. And so some companies want to buy, you know, failing, um, tech companies, you know, failing SaaS businesses, companies that maybe raised money two or three years ago, and it just hasn't gone the way they planned. And so, you know, our private equity teams will give them, you know, a way out and, and, you know, help them take advantage of something that they built, you know, but want, just want to get out of other companies will look to buy same assets, but they want companies that are on the up, you know what I mean? And they want companies that for the last four or five years have showed steady growth and they want to invest in those, grow them even more and sell them. Other companies want to buy e-commerce businesses, you know what I mean? That are in specific spaces, consumer goods. So as long as we know, you know, the, the thesis, um, we can create campaigns and generate deals um, based on what they tell us they want to buy. And that's, that's kind of the key to it. And so that, that's one example of clients that we work with. Others might be, um, you know, mergers and acquisitions deals. So strategic buyers, maybe there's a company that, you know, is um, you, you, you could even work in like the moving space and they want to do a roll up. And so they have, you know, they're, they have a competitive advantage and they want to buy, you know, X amount of, let's say 
50 million dollars worth of moving and storage businesses around a general region um and so we can figure out you know between talk by talking to them what exactly it is they're looking for what what type of numbers those moving companies need to do and then go help them generate the opportunities by getting in front of the company owners the business owners you know and doing our own research and so that's another example um so private equity companies with buy side mandates, you know, strategic buyers, aggregators, um, you know, those are, those are our bread and butter. What, uh, explain what an aggregator is. So an aggregator is, you know, and, and the ones that we, that we operate in are typically in the e-commerce space. And so an aggregator is a company that has either, you know, pulled together their own money or raised money from outside, you know, venture capital raised outside capital and is now strategically buying, you know, individual brands. Um, whether let's use Amazon, for example, you know, there's so many Amazon companies, they might be selling, um, they might be selling their own brand. So they, they might've taken, let's say something like a, um, a golf range finder, you know, and plugged a brand onto it and have been selling that successfully on Amazon. Um, and now, you know, so this company will come to them and, uh, the aggregator will come to them and, and purchase that company, that business. But then at the same time, you know, they might go buy a, um, a golf club company and they might go buy a golf apparel company. They might go buy, you know, other companies that are in, in that existing space, or maybe just, you know, generalize it even more. They might be going after sports apparel brands. So, or an aggregator might say, instead of buying, you know, brands themselves, they look to buy um, businesses that are just selling, you know, kind of, general products so we have other companies that we work with who you know they're not necessarily going out and buying brands but they're going out and buying products that sell well so like for example it might be you know certain types of tile flooring or certain types of um you know like we have one client that you know owns a company that that buy that sells those sheet protectors like that go inside of binders and so it doesn't necessarily matter like that, that as a certain brand, it's more that like, you know, they have that as a product and it's a sturdy, reliable product and they package it well. So they package it in, you know, 200, 300, 400, 500 unit quantities. And, um, but an aggregator to, to kind of, I'm getting a little off track is someone who's looking to aggregate businesses. So buy, you know, take that fund, bring those businesses together under one umbrella and then run you know, their business model um, within all of those individual brands that they acquired. So with, with this, like, why, why would a private equity group, an aggregator or any of these kind of groups, why would they need you guys? Why not just do it themselves? Like, where do you guys fit in? What's an ideal kind of like sweet spot for you guys? Well, I'll tell you why. There's two reasons why we thought that, you know, and why we have, know now and, and, and thought at the beginning and our thesis was that this was a good idea. Um, one, because, you know, a lot of these mid-market funds, see the, the biggest, you know, multi, multi-billion dollar businesses, you know, they might not be the best fit because they've already, you know, they've been around for 50, 70 years and 40 years, whatever. And they've spent the money to grow out this massive, you know, in-house acquisitions team. Um, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of mid-market companies who they might have a small acquisitions team or their acquisitions team might be, you know, one of the, the leaders of the fund, you know, one of the owners of the fund, one of the, the people that are also responsibility, responsible for raising the money. And so what we found and what Brian realized in being in this space for so long is that um, a lot of the processes they were using are outdated, right? So it would be, hey, we have this buy side mandate and we're looking to buy, again, I'll just come back to the moving company example. Um, you know, these individuals would be Googling local moving companies, picking up the phone, calling each individual one, you know, one by one, um, you know, not getting to the, the right person, going back, Googling again and doing that manual process and they'd get through, you know, maybe 10 calls in a day. Um, so that was completely outdated. So we took modern processes and we were like like this world needs this you know they need to be able to cycle through you know hundreds and hundreds of potential outreach attempts on every any given day and so that's what we do is we take these modern outreach approaches and apply it um to what we thought was an outdated world secondly you know it's just 
no matter how much money you have, whether it's a billion dollar fund or, you know, um, you're a, you know, a mid-market company, having an in-house team doing this stuff is expensive, you know? And so at the end of the day, um, you know, you, you, you got to really kind of take a look at it as a company, you know, you're again, coming back to overhead, you know, to hire three analysts, you know, in this space is going to between their payroll and insurance and, you know, workers comp and all this stuff, you know, it's going to probably be half a million bucks to do that for a year. And with us, you know, we charge a yearly retainer. So we will come on your business and we'll give you that year worth of effort. And our yearly retainer is $10,000. And so the $10,000 essentially allows us to cover our overhead for the year, you know, in a lot of ways in running most of these campaigns and doing it because we found ways to do it really efficiently, um, but really effectively at the same time. And then the only other time that they pay us is for success. So we've kind of designed our model where, you know, we're in it with you. We become an extension of your team. So when we, when you succeed, we succeed. So if you have, you know, a hundred million dollars you need to go out and spend, you're not paying us to hopefully find, you know, a way to spend it. Like we're not charging you $5,000 a month to hopefully find a way to expend it. Or in that example that I used, that would probably be $25,000 a month to pay three analysts you're paying us only when we go out and actually find it and you actually make that acquisition. And so that's the model that we've created and it's way more affordable. Um, our incentives are completely aligned because again, you know, we're taking a small piece of a big, meaningful, impactful investment that you've made. Um, so that's, that's how we've kind of crafted our offer so that, you know, not only are we doing things that you weren't already doing by applying technology, but we're doing them in a way less expensive in in more aligned manner. Yeah. Awesome. 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 Let's, let's do this. We'll, we'll give a few opportunities to do this, but for, you know, private equity groups, uh, aggregators, people with a buy side mandate, maybe holding companies, these kind of groups that are looking to actually go out and acquire and they need some help. Maybe they don't have a massive in-house team, or maybe they just need some help creating more of those deal flow. Where's a good place for them to connect with you and do a deal? Absolutely. Um, well, they can email. So our, our website is just postedsocial.com. Um, we've, we've recently, you know, this year, um, branded it around exactly what we're talking about, you know, so for while Brian was running it for his first, the first seven, eight years, you know, again, he was offering more services. We are solely focused on doing this right now and, and within in this space. And so that's the best place to go is post to social.com to learn more about what we do. And then they can reach out to me directly on LinkedIn, just Joe Zanka, or email me, you know, jzanka at postedsocial.com. And, you know, I'm always, I pride myself and so does Brian on just being responsive. And so if I see that email come in, you know, I'll get back to you and, and, and we'll book a call and, and learn about, you know, what, what you need. And, and our job is to go try to fix it. Yeah. So what does, what does future success look like for you? You're a deal maker. You've, you've exited a business. You've started a few, like you're, 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 uh, you're a deal maker. You seem like you love the game. How do you know you won? Like, what does, uh, what's that look like for you? Well, that's a great question. And I try to, you know, part of like doing business, I think what I've learned, you know, from starting my own business at the beginning is you do have to have an end game in mind, you know, and it, you don't necessarily have to like achieve that exact end game when you first getting started, but you do have to like shoot for something and, and know why you're doing something. And so I myself want to, you know, I want to be mindful of my, I want, I want to get to a point where I'm very mindful of my time. So right now I'm doing and working with you know, a lot of groups who are actively investing, um, learning from what they're investing in, you know, where the spaces to be are, why they're, why those spaces to be are important. And, and uh, you're just being a sponge while providing as much value as I can to my clients. Um, cause eventually I think my goal would be to be doing what, you know, my clients are doing, which is raising my own funds and buying my own companies and plugging operators into those businesses. And so to me, I thought that, you know, it would be wise to add as much value to those individuals as I can, because it will allow me to learn. And then by learning and while learning, you know, I'll, I'll figure out what I want to do, 
you know, once I'm at that point and, and then go and do that. So I, I kind of am working for who I want to eventually become at the moment. And then once I'm there, you know, I think that my first goal would be to, um, you know, hopefully generate enough passive income for myself where like, you know, my family and me personally could live, um, you know, our lives and I wouldn't have to work anymore. You know what I mean? And I think I'm always someone that's going to be involved in deals and, and enjoying working and owning businesses and real estate, whatever it may be. But I'd love to reach that level of financial freedom. Whereas like if I, for whatever reason, had to take a year off or wanted to take a year off, I could, and, and everything would be fine because of what is being generated in the background. So that's what I'm working towards um, every day is trying to get there. Yeah. During this interview, um, what questions should I've asked you or that you wish someone would ask you that I didn't? Whew. Um, it could be business or personal, whatever. Yeah, no. Um, I mean, I think that one thing I learned about, you know, myself and that you shouldn't, not that you should have asked me, but like, I think you, you might've asked me and with your last question is like, why are you doing what you're doing? You know? And I think that that is a question to be that you need to answer first. You almost need to answer it like every day. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, I think totally. you really do need to answer it every day because I didn't answer it for such a long time, you know? And, and I thought I was answering it, you know, but I was answering it like so broadly, you know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm not a good employee, so I'll work for myself. That's not a good answer. You know what I mean? That's not a good answer to that question. Yes, you should work for yourself if you're not going to be fulfilled or good at working for someone else. But like, why are you going to work for yourself? Like, what other benefits is that bringing you? Because if it's not bringing you the monetary benefits that you need to live your life, if it's not bringing you the uh, freedom that you want within your life, if it's not bringing you the satisfaction, you know, that you, like, I don't know. I, I think that you need to be really happy um, doing what you're doing, you know, and, and, and have a real strong reason why you're doing what you're doing. And um, it, every day is not going to feel that way. You know, you're going to question yourself still. You're going to question your motive, you know, you, how you, like if you're going on the right track still, but if you wake up every day and understand why you're doing what you're doing, then it allows you to continue forward and it allows you to it, just such a like freedom off your back, you know, knowing that like you do have a North star and that you're working towards it. And so I think the quicker you can identify that, like, Hey, why am I doing what I'm doing? You know what I mean? If, whether it's, whether you're sitting behind a desk and the answer is, Hey, I'm working this job from nine to, you know, or eight to three 30 because I have kids and after 3.30, I want to be able to dedicate the rest of my life to spending time, the rest of my night to spending time with my kids and never missing a game. If that's your why, great. You know, you know what you're doing. If it's to make a billion dollars, you know what I mean? Then you, you have a different why. Um, but if you understand that, then you're, you're going to be able to set yourself up on a path to hopefully achieve it. And so I, I didn't understand that for a long time. And, and now I feel blessed because I do wake up every day with an, with a general understanding of, of why I'm working on what I'm working on. And I think that that has helped me personally so much. Yeah. So many cool questions that I want to ask you around that. I, I love your, your description of this as like, we should be asking ourselves this every day. What if one day you, you wake up and you ask that question and you don't have an answer? Like, why am I doing this? And then the answer is null and void. Like there, you don't have a, a strong argument. How do you approach that? I, I think you have to work towards changing that. I really do. I think that I don't think like, I'll give you an example. I mean, I had someone in my life, right. Who, um, they're a teacher and, and they go to work every day, you know, and aren't necessarily happy with where they're at. And for reasons why they like, they're just completely out of their control. It's not that they don't want to teach. It's not that they love teaching, you know, the culture of a school might be, you know, brutal. And, and so the, and, and that's something that they don't have the ability to change. And so it's kind of making what they're doing in their everyday life, you know, um, seem miserable and, and like, there's not really much of an end to that happening. Mm -hmm. And so to me, the only option, you got to be able to control what you can control. And if you can't control the environment that you're in, then I think you need to leave it, you know? And I think that my advice for that person was like, you know, Hey, there's a price, like, yes, there's risk 
in not having a job, right? Like you don't want to not have, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you're completely stuck or, you know, you're putting other people at risk if you have children or anything like that. But there's a price. A lot of people don't put like a, they always think money, right? Like what's the cost of me leaving this, but there's a price to like having peace of mind and knowing like in happiness, you know what I mean? That like, it, you just can't see every day. And so mm-hmm. imagine like waking up every day and not feeling stuck and not feeling unhappy with where you're going to work. You know, I don't know if you can put a dollar figure on that, but it's worth a lot, you know? And, and I think that you need to change what you're doing because of that. Like it's worth a lot, you know, and, and a lot of people don't realize like, just because you can't put like, Oh, it's not, it's, it's not worth a hundred thousand dollars. It's worth a lot. Like it's worth a lot of your happiness. It's worth a lot of your sleep. It's worth a lot of your, your like sanity and, and totally. you need to change. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's the things. So I call it like, oh, so good, dude. I call those kind of things like ralgas, right? So things that for me in my business, revenue and life generating activities, right? Life generating activity. Like that. Yeah. There's on the flip side of that, it's what do I hate doing that doesn't really produce a great return for me? So like for me, menial task, editing audio or like converting to MP3 and uploading or throwing on an ad bumper, right? I pay someone to do that, even if it's super expensive, right? Like I have to get that stuff off my plate so I can focus on what I love doing and what actually moves the needle in my in my superpower, right? I got to focus on that. So with that, what are some areas in your life that you think are your superpowers and then as a deal maker, and then on the flip side, what are areas that you you yourself have to either automate, delegate, or, or, you know, throw away? Sure. So I am, I'm like a vision guy. I I have, you know, I'm able to connect things visually, like, you know, in my head, even um, with like where I want the company should go, where I want the next steps to be taken, where, you know, I I try to work three or four steps ahead of where we're at right now, just so I have an understanding of like, why, again, why are we doing this? Like, if if I can't understand the next step, then I can't answer that question. And so I'm always kind of thinking that way, vice versa, you know, I, I know that within vision, you need operation. And so Brian is, is also, you know, incredibly talented, um, at, you know, doing similar things that like, we're, we're both talented in the same areas in the sense of like, we're both pretty good at, um, you know, making sales and relationships, but he's an incredibly talented operator. You know what I mean? And so we work really well together because I see the next step and he makes, he, he, he builds the bridge to get there. You know, and that's, um, I think, you know, it's really helpful finding that in our life. So I, I like to delegate a lot of the, you know, bridge building steps to him, which he actually enjoys doing and does without me even like, like we'll need to pop up a new page for our website and like it's done, you know, the next morning. Uh, he just does it. And I couldn't do that. You know what I mean? If I didn't have him, I'd certainly have to, similar to, you know, with like you mentioned the audio and stuff, I'd have to outsource all those tasks because I don't have the patience for it. It will drive me crazy. And it's not where I should be spending my time. Um, another thing I want to point out too, like talking about what we were had, what we had been talking about, you know, in those life building activities is like, you can uh, choose what you want to see, you know, and that's something that I didn't realize either, like for a long time, like you can choose how you perceive things or what you want to see. And, you know, for me, like I was told by so many people like, you know, Hey, promote yourself on like, use Twitter to like be a promotional tool, use Twitter as like this thing. And it just like completely wasn't for me. And it dragged me down. And it always was something that I felt like I needed to spend a couple hours a day on like writing things. I'm not even kidding. Like the day I deleted it off my phone, I like had, i just had this like clarity and like this energy, like just it's almost like I like got all this energy back from like yeah. not looking at it. And so like, if something, if you're like looking at something every day or you're worried about something every day, like Instagram, I'm sure is that way for a lot of people, you know, they're looking at like these models, right. And they're like, oh, I, and it's just consuming them, you know, like you don't have to look at it or you don't have to perceive things, you know, just switch the way you like perception or just shut it off altogether. 
and you'd yeah. be amazed at like what it does for you. <laughs> uh, it's so true. I, I deleted my Facebook account and I was, I was an early adopter with Facebook and I had thousands of, you know, friends and connections and, you know, friends. yeah, air quote friends, right? Yeah. I, but I got, I, I found myself getting so caught up in the negativity of, of, you know, this and that I got on it because I love people and I loved connecting with them. But when I saw like there, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of other stuff that came with it. And to be honest, I'm not strong enough to filter out the good and the bad. So I got caught up in the bad stuff, the, the people who were controversial and I went down a rabbit hole and I found my world getting dark. So I had to delete it happens, because I'm not strong enough. I'm yeah, really like, not. Don't, I don't watch the news. You know what I mean? I don't watch the news. Like I like to stay up to date with what's going on, but I'll get it through my own methods. You know what I mean? Through methods that I enjoy getting it from. Like I listen to podcasts, because a lot of the time they're talking about relevant topics, you know, and, and so I pick the people that talk about relevant topics that I like to listen to. And then I, I get my information that way, but I don't watch the news that's trying to spin everything to be some negative, you know, the world's burning because if you sit down and watch either or any of the mainstream news channels for 20 minutes, like you're going to get up and be like, what the hell is going on? Like everything's, <laughs> everything's failing. Like, I have no idea. Like, are we all right? Like there's, you know, the world's going to burn tomorrow and you just don't need that in your life. At least I don't, you know? And so it's another thing, like, you know, I'm not someone that's, I don't by any means try to be like a guru. I just like to say what's worked for me and like tuning out some stuff that you like, you don't enjoy seeing is, is another one of those things where you get back like so much energy. There's not a price you can put on it. Ah, uh, dude, I love these conversations because Behind every deal, there's a deal maker. And if you can learn a lot about the deal maker and how they optimize and their, their mindset and how they approach life and business, then you could see deals a lot more clearly. And that's why we started the show is to connect deals and deal makers. So we interview people. And I think you and Brian both experience this. You interview people and then you, you're like, oh, wait, I actually like you. We should do a deal together. So yeah, yeah. Our, our purpose and mission of this show is to connect deals and deal makers. So let me let me do this. Let me give you guys a plug. You're awesome, Joe. Uh, for fellow deal makers in the audience, private equity groups, um, um, aggregators, people with a buy side mandate, holding companies, even corporations doing strategic buys. Um, as always, reach out to our guests. But if you guys are looking for some help with deal gen, uh, reach out to Joe. His contact information will be in the show notes below so you could connect directly with them. Let them know that you heard them on the deal scout. Um, and you guys should do a deal together. Um, Joe, I think we'll, we'll wind up doing some more interviews in the future. You're fascinating. I would like to, in the future, just plant in this seed. I'd like to learn more about the mindset and about, you know, your, your motive and the purpose driven kind of things of that, that you're focused on, but uh, we're running out of time today. Uh, one more time, tell people how to connect with you. Yeah, no, I appreciate all this, Josh. And I, you're awesome too, man. And I would love to have those conversations and, and I learn a lot of, from what, you know, we're talking about right now from other people, you know what I mean? Like my own show, I took so much from doing 200 episodes, yeah. talking to entrepreneurs. It was unbelievable. Like every episode, someone would teach me something new about how to look at things or how to, how they perceive things. And I'm the same way. And so that's why I am pretty eager to get back into the podcasting world because, you know, that was a huge form to learn. But yeah, if you want to reach out to me, it's Joe Zanka on LinkedIn. That's a great place to find me um, or Jay Zanka at postedsocial.com. Uh, or you can just visit postsocial.com and fill out that form at the bottom. And Brian or I are always monitoring it. So we'll reach out. Cool. Cool. Fellow deal makers, as always, reach out to our guests, say thank you, find a way to do a deal with them. Uh, and if you personally are working on a deal, maybe uh, trying to acquire or, or buy something and you want to chat about it here on the show, head on over to thedealscout.com, fill out a quick form, get you on the show next. Till then, talk to you all on the next episode. Cheers, everybody.